music of the prelude. <laughs> Nearly every culture mentions clay in its creation myth. The biblical creation story pictures God scooping up a handful of clay, shaping a human creature, and breathing life into it. Is that because clay is so like us? Up from the bed of the river, God scooped the clay. This great God kneeled down in the dust, toiling over a lump of clay, till he shaped it and into it blew the breath of life. Born in the womb of God, we made of clay and spirit, our vessels of the vision and essence of God. Fill us, good potter God, with your word and your ways, that we may be vessels of you. her when the priest came to call. He had a vision and he needed her expertise in the beauty that she continuously created. The potter's friend, the village baker, had lovingly baked communion bread for the parish for over 40 years, but she died last night and the entire village was heartbroken. The priest wanted a way to pour the love and comfort of God over everyone to soothe their grief. Would she make a jar to hold the oil 
that would anoint the heads of her friends? I expected her to just say yes, to seize the opportunity to comfort those who mourned. But she didn't. She just looked at him and wept. Silently, with tears flowing freely, she went to her wheel, centered the clay, and with her own tears mingling with the softening clay, she began. Inside this clay jug there are canyons and pine mountains, and the maker of canyons and pine mountains. All seven oceans are inside, and hundreds of millions of stars. The acid that tests gold is there, and the one who judges jewels. And the music from the strings no one touches, and the source of all water. If you want the truth, I will tell you the truth. Friend, listen. The God whom I love is inside. My joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick. Hark, the cry of my poor people from far and wide in the land. Is God not in Zion? Is her sovereign not in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their images, with their foreign idols? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of my people, I am hurt, I mourn, and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears, so that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. In this lament, the prophet does not restrain himself. My joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick. Hark, the cry of my poor people from far and wide. Is God not here? The prophet's question is universal. Have we been spiritually, practically, totally abandoned by God? This question isn't there for a test of faith. It's a reasonable human query, born of the insurmountable troubles of the world. From time to time, when it's all too much, we can feel alone and helpless and left to our own devices. And, like those who are the object of Jeremiah's frustration, we too may turn away, giving up on, if only for a while, an often too distant source of hope. Is there no balm in Gilead? The prophet cries in desperation. Now some commentators contend that these words of Jeremiah are not actually his own. Rather, that they are a lament from the broken heart of God who pours out despair because God's very own people have abandoned the life that God has led them to live. But did you notice, it's a subtlety, that even through divine tears, God still names these betraying people as my people. That hasn't actually always been God's response to the people of Israel. Remember the golden calf incident? Everybody remembers that, right? God had just led them out of slavery and into the desert towards the promised land. But the people were both distraught and outraged that Moses had been away upon the mountain for so long. They decided they had been abandoned 
and that they would make something tangible to worship the golden calf. And God, of course, was not amused. In fact, God God threatens to destroy the whole lot of them and start all over again. God then says to Moses, Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. Yahweh effectively disowns them all with no interest in reconciling, offering no provision for a way forward for healing this severed relationship. What a contrast that is to these words that we hear from the mouth of the prophet Jeremiah. Here, God seeks healing and wholeness for the nation regardless of their behavior. Not an end to the relationship. Instead of saying, your people to Jeremiah with no option for restoration, God continues to say, my people. And God then calls the prophet, calls the people to turn, to repent, in order to save their future and that relationship. Walter Brueggemann suggests that the prophet's words are not a prediction, neither are they an attempt to scare people into repentance. Rather, Jeremiah uses hyperbole to awaken people who have become numb to the Spirit, unaware of just how far they've wandered from spiritual health, how much harm they were doing to themselves. To heal, then, they must turn from their harmful ways. But it seems they've forgotten it all. They've forgotten God's ways. They no longer then know God. This notion of knowing God is a prominent theme in the prophetic literature of the Hebrew Bible. But that's sort of, at least to me, kind of an elusive concept. What might it mean to know God? If we look deeper into this Hebrew notion, we'll find that knowing God is linked directly, directly to doing justice. To know God, then, is to do what is good and right, what is compassionate and just. So Jeremiah's people have abandoned the way of God. That is, the way of justice and love and hope. And the whole of humanity, the whole of creation suffers when they or when we (coughs) inflict hurt or violence on one another. We harm the whole. The scripture says it like this, when one suffers, all suffer. And the very earth groans. The tears of the prophet express the grief of God for God's people. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? No one who can fix the problem. And the people, of course, have their own grief, their own injury. They've been physically, politically attacked from the enemy to the north who would evict them from their own land. And they're experiencing famine. The harvest has passed, the prophet says, and the summer has ended. The growing seasons are over, and yet they are not fed. I suspect that they're spiritually hungry as well as physically. They've been bombarded with trouble from within, and from without. They need relief from the despair, the pain, the violence that has penetrated and hardened their own spirits. They need renewed hope for hearts that have sought comfort and healing in that which simply cannot help. Is there no balm for them? The state of affairs in our world may leave us 
in a state of comparable despair. And of course, it doesn't stop when we turn off the ever more depressing news. It extends to, it infiltrates our own spirits. Like the people of Judah, our inner despair is not unconnected to those things that plague us in the outer world. And then in our disillusionment, our fear, our anger, we too may turn to behaviors and attitudes that gradually, almost unnoticeably, become part of our lives and turn us from God's ways. It may not be the sins of the Israelites, but we too gossip and nurture negative attitudes that look for one another's wrongs. We procrastinate in doing good. We hold grudges. We look down on others to build ourselves up. Is there nothing that can save us from the horror and cruelty of the world or from our resulting attitudes and behaviors? Is there no balm for us? Jeremiah's answer is, you don't need to go to the mountain of Gilead. You have the balm right here. There is no medicine that can heal despair and hopelessness like the spirit and word of God that implores them and us to return to the life-giving ways of love and justice. That is the balm for our souls. Now, in Jeremiah's world, clay pots were used to hold that balm, that healing oil that soothed dry and cracked skin and promoted healing for wounds. And so Jeremiah calls the desperate, hopeless, renegade, exhausted people to return to the potter, to the potter's house where the balm that will heal and renew can pour over them. Jeremiah says again, God is the potter and we are the clay. And in this message from Jeremiah, in this pointing out of the people's straying, I would ask this question. What sort of potter would just ignore the cracks in a vessel? Just let it be defective, unable to function. What sort of potter would overlook a pot that wasn't centered properly? Would just let it go. The potter and the prophet don't do that. Instead, they call out the people who have abandoned God's way of life so that they can be reshaped into sound vessels of love and justice. God is the potter. We are the clay, the vessels that hold and pour out tears of despair, fear, guilt, pain. But we are also vessels of the healing balm of the Spirit. Inside this clay jug, the poet writes, there are canyons and pine mountains. Well, inside this clay jug, there are tears of disappointment, fear and guilt. And the poet continues, inside this clay jug is the maker of canyons and pine mountains. If you want the truth, I will tell you the truth. Friend, listen. The God whom I love is inside. The prophet, while calling the people in no uncertain terms to turn, assures them and us that beyond the despair, there is hope. That beyond our brokenness, there can be healing. The tears and the balm here in this vessel. We hold in our own spirits that balm in Gilead. 
May we know that and then pour it out liberally on our own hearts, on each other, and on the wounds of the world. Amen. seated to receive the benediction and the blessing of the postlude. Well, that was a balm. You sound like one big, wonderful choir. Thank you for that beautiful gift, and thank you for the acapella, uh, Diana. Isn't it wonderful to have the choir back? Yeah, so pleased. Thank you to all who are making these pottery services so beautiful for Barbara Everett, not only for the monologues, but for the beautiful visual displays that lead us into the sanctuary and then greet us when we get here. Thank you again, Shell, for throwing a pot last week. How incredible was that? And for our worship team who does such a beautiful job of planning. As we continue to consider ourselves as the clay, as vessels, may we know that in them we keep a well of emotion. May we not keep it pent up. May we bend that pot and pour out the feelings of our soul in prayer and to one another. And then when there's more room in that pot, may we know that the Spirit will pour in that balm to heal us and that we in turn can use to anoint and heal the suffering of the world. As we ponder these beautiful images, may we do so in the love of God, with the great example of Jesus who shows us the way, and with the power of the Spirit living within us to make it all so. Amen.
Thank you.